Everything was great, right, in the graphical solution. You could see the corner points, you could see the improving direction, you could find out the optimal solution very easily. Now you won't have the luxury of seeing everything in a graph. You won't be able to see, visualize the corner points and move to the corner points. All right, that's our problem. So we want, so everything I have been saying from the beginning of this, today's lecture is because I need an algebraic way of characterizing these corner points, okay? I can visualize them, but if I have three variables, four variables, million variables, how do I characterize them, okay? So because of all this, we came to the standard form requirements. So it's not just an any LP. I want a systematic, structured LP. For that LP, I can say here is the one-to-one -one correspondence to the corner points, and that's standard, that's standard form LP, okay? So that's why we first converted our LPs to the standard form LP in order to be able to have this one-to-one -one correspondence. And then that brought us to the notion of basic solutions. Okay, now if I have a standard form LP, and if I know that this is full row rank, which is another of my requirements, I can always do my partition of, where is it? Where I do? Okay, let's do it again. So I have AX equals to B. Forget about non-negativity for a sec. I know that it's full rank. Full rank means what? If I have M rows and N columns, it means that I can partition my A into columns which are linearly independent, M such columns, and the remaining ones which I don't care how they are related to each other, and minus M columns. All right, so I had columns A1, A2, AN. M of these are linearly independent. I just take them, put them in the beginning, and the remaining are my remaining set of columns. Okay, why am I doing this again? Why am I bothering with the standard form and with this requirements, with specific solutions of AX equals to B? I have lots of solutions. You were able to find any one of these solutions in 225. Here, you want not just any solution, but the ones that correspond to these corner points, okay? Because those are your potential optimal solutions, and you will restrict your attention to these potential optimal solutions. Make sense? So that's why we're bothering with all this. That's why we first translated everything into equation form. We had the luxury of adding extra variables. That's why all of my variables are non-negative. I got rid of redundant constraints, and I brought to the form in which it is full row rank. This is all because I want this one-to-one -one mapping to my corner point solutions. Okay? Does it make sense? Now, and this is without loss of generality now. If I have my rank of A, it's full row rank, M, I can always bring the first M to be linearly independent than the remaining. Now, AX equals to B is the same as if I do the same partition accordingly with my basic and non-basic variables, I have BXP plus NXN equals to little b. Correct? It's the same system AX equals to B translated and written in a form in which I have submatrices and corresponding variables multiplying its corresponding submatrices. Okay, now I'm also going to say that XN is the set of all non-basic variables and I am going to set them equal to zero. So I have reduced my AX equals to B system into M equations and M unknowns, and because B is invertible, I have XB as uniquely B inverse B. Does it make sense? So this is only one of the potential infinitely many solutions of AX equals to B, 
But such a structured solution has the potential of being one of the corner point solutions in my graph that I aim to find. Does it make sense why we are trying all this? Cool. Okay, and this is always possible after the assumptions of bringing everything to the standard form with a full row rank. We'll do it in an example in just a sec, but as a structure, these are the solutions that I call basic solutions, and these are going to be my limitations within the list of corner point solutions, and this is always possible. Okay, so I did my partition, look at on the left, I get to a solution, the solution is unique. After you give me the partition, the solution is uniquely attained, and it's called the basic solution. Now I only cared about AX equals to be in this, finding this basic solution, if on top I have non-negativity requirement also satisfied, the B inverse B vector is non-negative. I call it a basic feasible solution. And these are exactly the same as our corner point solutions. Okay, which is my whole aim from the beginning of today. Try to map some algebraic way of solutions to AX equals to B system to my corner point solutions graphically. Does it make sense? Okay, now let us see it on an example. Now the example, I am going to convince you that these basic feasible solutions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these corner points. So I'm going to assume I have a two-variable case. I translated it into a standard form in which I know the algebraic characterization of corner points, and then I am taking on from that standard form on. Okay, so let us consider the left-hand side. I have a two-variable case, two non-negative variables, right? Two constraints. It can have more constraints as long as you have two variables, you can draw it. But let us say that that was your original LP, which you can draw and find the solution very easily, and you translated it into standard form. How did you do that? You had less wrinkle to constraints, you, you added slugs to either one of them. The slugs have to be non-negative. So that's a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence in terms of the solutions, right? You give me the solutions here, fix them as x1 and x2, solve for x3 and x4. You give me an x1, x2, x3, x4 vector, reduce it to x1 and x2, that will be a solution to the left-hand side, correct? Okay, typically, of course, we'll use this with much larger LPs, but I want you to see the correspondence between the basic feasible solutions and the corner point solutions of the LP, all right? Now, as you see with the definition of a basic solution or a basic feasible solution, all I care about is the system of equations, right? I don't care about the objective. So forget about the objective for a sec. We don't care about finding the optimal solution, we just aim to find these corner point solutions, both algebraically as well as geometrically. Sounds good? Okay. Now, that's my feasible region. I could draw it very easily. Let me have it also here. Oops, yep. Okay, so I had my two variable LP. I drew the feasible region. This is from last time, from 102. You can draw it very easily, right? Now the question is, after I do the translation, can I find the set of four basic feasible solutions, the algebraic notion which will correspond to the corner points over there? That's the idea. Make sense? Okay, so let's see. I am now looking at the standard form. And in the standard form, look at the constraint matrix A. Simply take the four columns over here. X is an X vector of four variables, and I have little b, six and three. Okay? Does it satisfy the requirements of standard form? Am I ready to start the simplex method or to talk about basic feasible solutions? What I want is for the rank, to be, what do I want the rank to be? 
two, right? M is equal to two here. Is the rank of this matrix two? Then I'm going to divide it into B and N components, where B is invertible, and B is M by N, or in this case, M equals to two, two by two. Is it the case? Does it have rank equal to two? If you look at the last two columns, they're the columns of the identity, these two columns. So yes, this has rank two, and it cannot be more than rank two because it has two rows only. Sounds good? So let me ask you the question. Forget about the corner points now. I gave you a definition of basic solutions. How many potential basic solutions can you attain with this matrix? Is the question clear? So what did I do to get a basic solution? I had my A matrix. I divided it into two. The first M columns were linearly independent and then the remaining. How many potential such ways are there for me uh, to do this division? So I take A, I divide it into columns which are linearly independent and the remaining. How many potential ways do I have in this matrix? I want the B to be two columns. I have four already. So how many potential ways of doing this? Come on. Four choose. Two, right? Thank you. So six potential ways of breaking it down into B and N, where B is an invertible matrix, and I don't care about the remaining N. So I have four columns. I could pick any two, and any two could be linearly independent, resulting in a proper basic solution. So I have six potential basic feasible solutions here. Let's see how many indeed will turn out to be a proper basic solution. Does it make sense? So for example, I could, uh, I, could take, I could take first of all one and two as my two columns in the B matrix, one and three, one and four, two, three, two, four, and three, four. So all these possibilities will lead to a breakdown which might lead to a basic feasible solution. So let's see all of these possibilities. Let us look at the first choice. I am, I am taking the first two columns. The first two columns from my A matrix are going to be my basic columns, and then the remaining ones, X3 and X4, are going to be my non-basic columns. All right, is this a good partition? So x1, x2, x3, x4 are my columns. I took the first two as my basic, the remaining as my non-basic. So what do I want from a proper partition? I want B to be invertible. Is this B matrix invertible? Is it? The determinant is non-zero, so it is invertible. So what will I do? I will pick these non-basic variables. I will set them equal to zero. All right? If I set them equal to zero, what will happen? In the system, they will disappear. And I will have a unique solution in terms of x1 and x2. What will be that unique solution? x2 would be equal to 3, x1 would be equal to 3 as well. All right? That's exactly what we're doing when we are doing this partition. I took the first two columns to the beginning. That's my B matrix, basis matrix, the remaining. I set the non-basic variables equal to 0. The non-basic variables are equal to 0. They are x3 and x4 in this case. And then I have a unique solution in terms of my basic variables, which is this B inverse B. Make sense? So if you apply it here, B inverse B, what is B inverse? If B is this matrix over here, you have your B inverse, 
you can find out very easily. Multiply it with your right hand side, 6, 3, and then you get your values for x1 and x2. All right, that's exactly the x1 and x2. Where am I? That's exactly the x1 and x2 after you fix x3 and x4 equals to zero. Does it make sense? So I get a vector, and this vector is this four component, 3, 3, 0, 0. Correct? It has all my values in it, which are non-negative. So not only is this a basic solution, but it is also a basic feasible solution. Does it make sense? So in other words, if you go back to your graph, do you have a correspondence of this basic feasible solution to some corner point there? Exactly your corner point over here, 3, 3, corresponds to this basic feasible solution. I have four variables here. Remember, to get to the standard form, I added more variables. Those are two variable case. If I reduce it to the two variable case, to the values x1 and x2, 3, 3, it will correspond to my corner point over here. Sounds good? So I got one of them with my enumeration. Let's see whether I can get all of them. And I have six potential. What will happen to the four? I only have four here, right, in my graphical solution. So let's see what happens. Let's look at the second one. So in the second one, uh, in the second one, I took one and three as the columns of my B matrix. So I am enumerating all possible ways of taking two columns. Now I take one and three. But one and three corresponds to this matrix which has what faults? What is wrong with this matrix? It's not invertible. So in other words, this is not going to lead to a basic feasible solution or a basic solution. That's the must requirement, right? I do my partition. The columns in the B matrix should be linearly independent. So one of the six is now gone, which is nice. I want the correspondence to only four. So the choice cannot be a basic solution, as the slide says. Let us choose one and four. What is one and four? One and four are actually the columns of the identity matrix. So they will have a unique solution. What will be that unique solution? So which ones am I setting equal to zero now? One and four are my basic variables, so two and three are set equal to zero. So I will have a unique solution, as you see on the right hand side. It's the same as multiplying on the side B inverse with little b. Okay? So I will get x1 equals 6, x2 4 equals to 3. That's exactly the basic feasible solution that I have over here. Make sense? And in terms of my graph, where am I? Where's my graph? 6, 0. Look at x1 and x2 only. I have 6, 0. If I reduce it to this system, that's exactly my corner point over here. Sounds good? So are you a little bit more convinced that this is the algebra basic solutions, this is the actual corner point solutions, and that's why we need all of this algebra uh, to handle it? OK. Still more enumeration, right? Uh, okay. One, four is gone. Now I have two and three. So what happens with two and three? Oops. Uh, two and three. What will be the unique solution? Can I use this B matrix with two and three? It's invertible, therefore I can use it. Two and three will be fixed to zero. I'm sorry, one and four will be fixed to zero. So these will go, I will have x2 equals to three and x3 equals to three, all right? So that's my other basic feasible solution. Again, this is also a basic feasible solution. The feasible, the F 
in the middle corresponds to that vector being non-negative. Okay? Now I have in my, which one did I find? Which corner point? I am over here, right? The zero and three, I look at x1 and x2 values, the zero and three corresponds to this particular corner point. So I have three already. What about the other one? Let's look at x2 and x4 and get to the solution. So if I look at x2 and x4, I am setting x1 and x3 to zero, right? So what does it mean x2 is equal to six? If you look at on the right hand side, and x4 equals two minus three. If you use b inverse b multiplication, you will get to this vector. Now what is wrong with this vector? It's not feasible, therefore it cannot be one of the corner points belonging to the feasible region. So this is not, it's basic, but not feasible. All right, so it will not correspond to one of the corner point solutions in my two variable case. Where would it correspond to, you think, in this dimensions, in the graphical part? If you look at the 0, 6, the x1 and x2 values, it's actually this point over here, which is still the intersection of lines, but it's not in the feasible region, so it's not one of these feasible corner points. All right? So you should, at this point, see the relation, this algebraic basic and non-basic variable partition notion actually gets you to the intersection of lines in two dimensions, and that's exactly what you want from your corner point requirements. And we have all possible ways of intersecting and getting the equations and getting the solutions. Some of them, which are all non-negative, will turn out to be feasible corner points. Others will be just corner points out there, like this one, which is not a feasible one. Make sense? Okay, so we have found three BFSs. We have found one basic solution which is not feasible. We have found one which we do not read to a basic solution. And the last one, number six, is choosing x1, x3 and x4 as my basic variables. And that leads to this other corner point which is my <coughs> origin over here. Okay, so I have enumerated <coughs> all possible four corner points with my algebraic characterization. Is that clear now? Back again, why did we do all this? We brought everything to the standard form equations, non-negative right-hand sides, non-negative variables, because simplex method and Danzig likes those, right? And because we wanted an algebraic way of saying, here is your corner point solution. It's enough to just look at this corner point solution. Sounds good? If you go back, we have found four basic feasible solutions, another basic one which was not feasible because of the non-negativity, and now you see the correspondence of these four corner points to each one of those actual corner points in two dimensions. Does it make sense? Okay, here I list what are the basic variables corresponding to each of these vectors. So that's vector A, it's this one. The ones which are non-zero are my basic <coughs> variables in the standard form for that particular vector. So x3 and x4 are my basic variables in the origin in vector A. x1 and x4 are my basic variables in vector B. They're actually the non-zero ones in vector B. Does it make sense? So I have four sets of vectors. Two of these variables are basic, two non-basic. Non-basic ones are always zero. So the non-zero ones are the only non-basic uh, ones. So I have for each of these corner points, what is the set of basic variables, and the remaining ones are non-basic variables. All right? So this nice one-to-one -one correspondence 
between the corner points and basic feasible solutions. Okay, and how do we get the number six? What are the possible ways of choosing out of these four columns two linearly independent columns? Our example had n equals to four, m equals to two, and that's why we had six potential ones out of which only four turned out to be corner point solutions. In general, if you have n variables and m constraints, you have n choose m possible basic feasible solutions. Okay? So one thing that comes to mind, why don't we enumerate all possibilities? So we know that one of these corner points or basic feasible solution is going to be optimal, enumerate all possible ones, plug into the objective function, see which one is the best one, and return that as the optimal solution. What's wrong with that algorithm? It's an algorithm, right? It will solve your problem. It will solve your problem but for any ax equals to bx non-negative and the objective. What would be wrong with that? It's, it will take too much time, exactly. So yes, in two variables, enumerating these four potential solutions is not a big deal, but n choose m could be a very, very large number. Okay, so enumerating all would be, uh, let me give you the number, would be too expensive. So if you have 20 variables and 10 constraints, and this is not even moderate size, it's a very, very small LP considered to what's being sold, you have to find out that uh, many number of basic feasible solutions in the potential worst case, enumerate all of their solutions and find the best one, okay? So this is not a good way of dealing with it, okay? But what we know so far and what was our aim today is that now a point in the feasible region of an LP is a corner point or an extreme point in your wording if and only if it is a basic feasible solution to my LP. Okay, so there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence. Now I can forget about this graph part. I won't have it with too many variables anyway and consider only basic feasible solutions. And if you recall your fundamental theorem of LP, what did it say in the two variable case? It said that one of these corner points, if there exists a feasible solution, one of these corner points has to be a solution if there exists an optimal solution, there is also a corner point which is optimal. Now you don't say corner point, you say basic feasible solution and basic feasible solution for optimality and for feasibility, okay? This is true for an LP in standard form. Standard form requirement is a must, why do you think? So if I don't, what is the standard form? I have AX equals to B, X non-negative, right? This theorem, this fundamental theorem is only true with the non-negativity requirements as well. Why? Otherwise, for example, I could have, I could have just two lines parallel. This could be my feasible region. And in that feasible region, there exists no corner points. Even in two dimensions, this fails, right? So unless you have non-negativity, you're indeed forcing it to be in the non-negative orthant, you won't have the corner points. If you are in the non-negative orthant, you will have the corner points like this one because this is no longer, is going to be part of your feasible region. Sounds good, so fundamental theorem is only true for an LP standard form. Keep that in mind, X non-negative is a big must over there. Sounds good? Okay, so 
Again, back to our case, this theorem implies I could enumerate all possibilities and find the best one, but this will take too long. Even in a very, very small example, this will take too many steps, so that's not the way to go. And the way to go is the simplex method, which actually does it very, very fast, even though its worst case behavior is not as good, on the average, it does it in a linear form fashion. All right, so I just have to work as many steps as there are constraints in your system, and this is really, really fast. It's the fastest that you can expect from an algorithm. All right, so it's really, that's why simplex method is so powerfully used out there in everyday lives. Sounds good? Okay. Okay, now let's see if I can find my graph, all right. So remember simplex method is gonna start with somewhere at number one and it will go to a close by better solution like number two in the graph. Now the question is what is a close by solution? What is a neighboring solution? And how do I declare this neighborhood in Algebraic form, right? Neighborhood is easy, you just look. Do they share a line? Are they on the same line? Yes, one and two are neighbors. Two and three are neighbors. They share a line. But what does this mean of sharing a line in terms of the algebra? After you get to the basic feasible solution notion, how do you say two points are neighbors to each other? And that's why we need a definition for neighborhood of basic feasible solution, and the definition is very simple. We say that two basic feasible solutions are neighbors if and only if they share all but one of their basic variables. Okay, so all of their m minus one variables are common basic variables, only one of them could be different. Does it make sense? So if this is the case, then two vectors are neighboring basic feasible solutions and they share this line among them in geometry, otherwise they're not. Okay, so if I go to our graph over here, let's see if I can convince you, yes. All right, let's look at A and look at B. That's why we wrote down the set of basic variables. Now in A, the basic variables are x3 and x4. In B, what happened? x3 left, uh, I will do it. Okay, so x3 left, right? And x1 entered. So x1 and x3 sort of change roles and these A and B are neighbors. So I kicked out x3 in one of them, I put x1 in the other one, the other is kept intact, and these two are neighboring solutions. Okay, versus if you look at A and C, the basic variables in A are three and four, the ones in, B, in C are one and two, they don't share any basic variables, all right? And I want all of them except only one to be different. So A and C are not neighbors with this definition, but A and D, A and B, B and C, C and B are neighbors. Does it make sense? So A has two neighbors. It has a neighbor B. How do you get from A to B? You kicked out x3 as your basic variable, you put in x1 as your new basic variable. To get from A to D, what did you do? You kicked out this time, which one? x4 is kicked out, and in place x2 entered. All right, so you sort of, what do you do in getting from one corner point to a neighboring one? you take the roles of a basic and non-basic variables and you switch their roles, okay? And you get to a new solution. New potential solution, hopefully new potential solution, which is a better objective function value, and you will keep doing this until you're sure none of these changes, switches, will get you to a better objective function value. Yes? C and B. C and D are neighbors, yes. 
They, C and B are neighbors. Why are they neighbors? You tell me. What is the definition? Do they share all but one of their basic variables? So look at the basic variables. Only one could be different. So in C, I have basic variables one and two. In B, I have basic variables one and four. Two and four are different, but I allow for one difference in my uh, neighboring extreme point. In A and C, the difference is two, and that's not a lot, all right? So we want adjacency if I have M minus one basic variables, oops, in common. I have M basic variables, M minus one should be the same as others. Here, M is equal to two, so M minus one is actually indeed one, but I could have a set of basic variables, right? I could have 1,000 basic variables, and 999 should be the same in two neighboring sets of basic solutions. Does it make sense? So now we're sort of warming up to the simplex method. Somehow, I start with one of these basic feasible solutions, and then I exchange the roles of a basic and a non-basic one, and I get to a better one, all right? This exchange is called one of the variables leaving the basis, exiting variable, the other variable which will enter, entering the basis, all right? So we're always going to be talking about the current basis, the current columns of the B matrix. I will subtract out one column, I will put another one, I will require that the new set of columns are still linearly independent. So one column is entering from outside to the basis and one column is leaving from the current set of basic variables. All right, that change is going to constitute to a neighboring solution. So, all right, we have seen all this. So let's see the general description, what we want. What we have been doing so far for this, uh, since this morning, we have, first of all, to convert everything to standard form. That was the simple step. Uh, we have to obtain somehow a basic feasible solution, typically, in the beginning, this is going to be easy because I will give you problems like this in which origin is an obvious potential starting basic feasible solution, okay? And then we'll worry about how to find a basic feasible solution in general. So in general, I will have a basic feasible solution at every step, the current solution, and I will ask, can I improve upon the current solution? If not, I will declare it as the optimal one. Otherwise, I will seek a neighbor such that by exiting one of my basic variables and entering another one, by doing this change, I get to a better objective function. All right, we say that one of the non-basic variables becomes basic, and one basic variable becomes non-basic in this change. And then I will keep repeating, I will go, to the next solution, ask, is it optimal? If not, do these steps until you reach to your optimal uh, as we have over here. So start with one, go to two, three, at four, you will know that none of the neighbors will take you to a better condition in terms of the objective, so you declare this as your optimal one. Does it make sense? Good, simple idea. But how everything works is going to be dependent upon your uh, experiences and how you master these pivoting steps, okay? So pivoting, like I said, will come uh, essential at one point. All right, so let's see. The example that we want to handle is this one. I want to solve the LP on the left-hand side using the simplex method now, using this notion of basic feasible solutions and so on. But the LP on the left-hand side is not in the standard form, right? So I have to translate it to a standard form. Let's say that you added S1 and S2 to your equations. You translated 
it to standard form without a problem. Another thing that we want to do, and this is again without loss of generality, I'm going to write down my objective as if it's part of my constraint set and deal with this z value corresponding to the value of the objective as a basic variable like my other two basic variables. Again, I'm just extending my list of constraints. This is really no big deal. So I am going to write down an objective like z equals to c1 x1 through c n x n. Take z, take the right hand side, take it out, and make it an equation. So I take this over here. z equals to x1 plus 3 x2. I say that z minus x1 minus 3x2 equals to 0. Have I changed anything? Not really. And this now becomes part of my constraint set. I call it constraint 0. It's going to be row 0 from now. Why? It will make sense in just a sec. OK? And then I have my original constraints, but I could not deal with the lesser equal to constraints. Therefore, I changed them to the standard form. Now, this LP is in perfect condition to be able to apply the simplex method. All right? The problem that we need first is, can I find a basic solution to these two equations, basic feasible solution to these two equations, such that I can initiate my simplex and I can ask whether it's the optimal one, whether I should move or not. Sounds good? OK. So let's see. I have, this is just the example that we have seen, right? 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, 1. That's my A matrix. I again have potential basic feasible solutions for choose two. We're not going to enumerate all of them. We're going to pick a very simple one, very obvious basic set of variables. And the one that I'm going to pick is going to be corresponding to these identity columns. Why do I pick this? Taking its inverse is easy. Initiating is easy. So what in fact I'm doing is I'm taking, that was my x1, x2, s1, and s2. I'm taking s1 and s2, the slack variables that I just added, as my basic variables which means the original variables x1 and x2 in my system are non-basic variables. Their values will be set equal to 0. And if I set x1 and x2 equals to 0, I could pinpoint the unique solution s1 equals to 6, s2 equals to 8. All right? What is the objective function value corresponding to that solution? x1 is set equal to 0, x2 is set equal to 0. If you put your objective over here, 0, 0, you get the z value also equal to 0. All right? So if you look at row 0 here, delete x1, delete x2, you see that the z value currently is 0 corresponding to this solution. So in other words, I am looking at the solution x1, x2, s1, s2 x1, 0, 0, the others, 6 and 8. Does it make sense? It's one of the solutions. It's actually the simplest that you can think of. If you think about your original LP with less than equal to constraints, you're taking the origin as your feasible solution, right? x1 equals to x2 equals to 0 is your origin, you find S1 and S2 that calls for the unique remaining solution. In terms of our basic notions, I am associating the identity columns to the B matrix, and B inverse B is simply going to be the right-hand side, which is 6 and 8, and that's why I get the 6, 8 over here in my X vector. Sounds good? OK, so that's why we need this representation. We need a starting basic feasible solution. If you go to the left-hand side to variable case and draw the feasible region, you're exactly in this feasible region. This you can get very easily. And now what I'm asking you is to initiate your simplex method at this point with the, slack, with the basic variables corresponding to slacks S1 and S2. 
Okay? All right, please, before next time, remove all of this so that it sinks in.